اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم ام ڈاکٹر اعجاز اسلم اسسٹنٹ پروفیسر ان اسکول اف اسلامک اکنامکس بینکنگ اینڈ فائنانس منہا یونیورسٹی لاہور ائی وارملی ویلکم ٹو آل اف یو ان دا میگنیفیسنٹ ورلڈ اسلامک اکنامکس اینڈ فائنانس کانفرنس 2021 ام دا کوارڈینیٹر اف دس پینل سیشن ٹائٹل اسلامک فائنانس بلاک چین and crowdfunding digitalization of islamic economy landscape the <clears throat> professor dr husamuddin mulkawi is the moderator of this session he is the professor of finance in the british university of dubai we try to answer all the questions at the end of the session now i would like to invite prof husam to uh, to take the charge of the session prof husam so over to you thank you dr ajaz uh, bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah assalamu alaikum everybody uh, our uh, discussion panel today which is islamic finance blockchain and crowdfunding uh, digitalization of islamic economy and landscape uh, it's a really uh, interesting topic and uh, really a hot topic nowadays especially when we talk about the fintech and uh, uh, islamic finance uh, fintech has become one of the most dynamic and energetic segment of financial services marketplace around the globe uh, islamic fintech is in its infancy stage of course but compared to global uh, fintech industry however it's growing exponentially Uh, new Islamic uh, fi- uh, fintech uh, platforms have been uh, established in various countries such as Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, Bahrain, uh, Brunei, and United Arab Emirates. Uh, Islamic uh, robo-advisor have been also introduced and uh, blockchain technology is also being deployed by some Islamic uh, fintechs. Uh, Islamic fintechs has the potential to uh, revolutionize the whole Islamic financial industry by using advanced technologies the islamic fintechs have the potential to reshape the islamic finance by improving the efficiency of islamic financial services and to deal with the existing challenges uh, the use of islamic uh, fintech poses a lot of challenges as well as it explore numerous opportunities islamic fintech can uh, give a boost to startups as its parents accessible and easy to use and can gain customer confidence with an ease which is very important for startups the transaction and their blockchain are most transparent and visible to all users also uh, smart contracts can be useful mechanism in all financial transactions and the monitoring and regulation process can be reduced to mere writing a smart contract The cryptocurrency has been also a revelation and Muslim countries seriously need to have to find a way to develop a cryptocurrency fully uh, compatible with the Sharia principle. So this is the theme that we are going uh, to uh, discuss now, inshallah. And uh, just before I start introducing my uh, panelist, uh, I miss to really thank uh, Minhaj University and all the coordinators for this uh, event. It's really great event and I hope it will really contribute to the uh, Islamic finance uh, industry and to the Islamic finance as a, a discipline, inshallah. So uh, first of all, I will uh, start uh, with uh, our first uh, panelist. Uh, first, our first panelist, Dr. Uh, Hazik uh, Mohammed, is a managing director Uh, Settler Consulting Group, uh, Singapore. Uh, Dr. Hazik is a business strategic with substantial market research, operational management and startup experience. He focuses on growth, stability and sustainability through customized strategies, uh, Islamic uh, finance stru- uh, structuring, market analysis and strategic rollout. He is one of the pioneer authors in the field of fintech, Islamic finance and the blockchain. Uh, his two books on fintechs are blockchain, fintech and Islamic finance, building the future in the new Islamic digital economy. And also another book, which is beyond fintech, technology applications for 
uh, Islamic economy. So uh, please uh, welcome uh, Dr. Hazek uh, Mohammed. Uh, Dr. Hazek, I will uh, start uh, with a question about uh, recently that uh, about your books actually, which you published uh, recently with the title Beyond Fintech, uh, Technology Applications for Islamic Economy. First of all, I would like to congratulate you for the this great uh, contribution. Uh, my question is, uh, what do you think do Islamic financial institutions have adopted a right path or a strategy toward embracing fintech or the technological advancement? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can everyone hear me? Yes, clear. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Uh, like Prof. Usam, I would like to congratulate and uh, thank Minhaj University for organizing such an important conference, especially during these times that we are uh, in right now. Uh, and I'm glad to be joining from Singapore. Uh, and on this particular panel session uh, on FinTech. Uh, so thank you for the kind introduction, Prof. Usam. Um, to answer your question, I think um, Generally, when we talk about tech adoption, uh, we always start with uh, the low level tech or the simple tech. Uh, uh, when we want to try to change something or when we try to adopt uh, some kind of uh, change, there can be a huge paradigm shift. Uh, so from my observation, I think uh, the Islamic financial institutions have uh, moved uh, cautiously uh, in terms of uh, tech adoption. Uh, so, um, you do see some changes, but not really drastic changes. Uh, that's just the nature of uh, technology. Um, if you make too many or too drastic a change, uh, you're taking on too much risk, uh, technological risk. Uh, so usually in tech adoption, we recommend to approach in a very cautious manner. Uh, but of course, uh, we don't want to move too slowly uh, because if you move too slowly, then you tend to not uh, be able to benefit the entire uh, uh, you know, value that uh, technology can bring to your organization. Um, so in our first book, uh, Blockchain, FinTech, and Islamic Finance, uh, we, do, we have provided some kind of recommendations for Islamic financial institutions to move forward. Uh, it's either you partner with a startup or you create your own innovation labs within your organization and hire the right people to run it. And to, to work on the projects that you want to um, implement uh, from a technology perspective. Um, and then um, in my most recent book, uh, Beyond FinTech, I wanted the, uh, you know, the, you know, the tech adoption to, be, to go beyond uh, Islamic financial institutions. Uh, because finance, uh, in the view of the entire economy, uh, is only one section of uh, the entire economy. So uh, we need to look at tech adoption and this technological change, which uh, people simply just call FinTech, uh, but tech in a broader sense, uh, because um, tech obviously can make uh, or can create a lot of value uh, and it shouldn't be restricted only in the finance industry. It should be broadened to industries like uh, healthcare, you know, a lot of use cases there now that we are going through COVID-19 and still um, you know struggling to adopt with the new normal uh, and then another import there are many other uh, sectors but the other important sector which i want to single out is uh, manufacturing i think in the islamic countries we are not producing uh, products we are not the, uh, the people who are creating innovative products that people are adopting uh, so definitely tech adoption there would be uh, a wonderful avenue to look at Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hazek. You still have uh, some time to also to talk about, but in your opinion, uh, why the Islamic financial institutions are not really be able to adopt the authentic fast? Uh, yeah, they could be. I mean, uh, I, I, in other words, why they are moving cautiously? Yeah, so uh, there could be several reasons. Um, uh, 
Uh, it could be uh, there is a resistance to change, and we covered this in our uh, in our first book. There is a resistance to change within the management uh, itself, especially in the C level, the top level, right? The executive level, the CEOs, the CFOs, and the CTOs, the people who actually make the executive decisions. Uh, there could be one. Uh, it could be um, uh, which is prevalent in uh, many uh, organizations. They lack the tech uh, expertise. The, you know, the capacity of um, people that can actually build something complex, uh, you know, as complex as uh, a full uh, decentralized uh, public blockchain. Uh, so for blockchain, maybe we need to start with a privatized type of blockchain where you can control and you can watch over uh, the, uh, the process of how blockchain can connect or scale. Um, uh, and also, maybe um, they do not have the kind of um, uh, expertise to connect uh, with uh, the technology with the right use cases. Uh, if you see, uh, if you look back at uh, in 2016 when uh, blockchain was uh, gaining a lot of traction and you know people were getting funded left, right, center as soon as you use the uh, word blockchain in your startup or when you're pitching something, uh, you. After a year after that, you realize that uh, in 2017, the investments in blockchain actually went down. So this went down because uh, when you rush into uh, using a particular technology without uh, realizing the uh, proper use case for that particular technology, uh, the project will uh, undoubtedly fail. So when you have a lot of, uh, you know, you have millions of dollars being invested in, in such uh, projects, you you tend to take a step back and then hence uh, the, the receding uh, investments in blockchain in 2017. So uh, it could be a confluence of things. Uh, so I think uh, it's always good to take a cautious approach um, when you are feeling out your way, when you are not experienced in doing uh, this kind of uh, projects. Uh, you, you know, uh, even like when you're hiring a programmer, right? uh, if you're hiring a programmer, to work on a blockchain project, but he's actually an AI programmer, right? or he's a data analytics, or he's a data scientist. So there's a mismatch in uh, skill set. Right? So there are many things to, to look at. So uh, it's always uh, good to be cautious. Even Al Quran always advises us not to be in haste, right? Do not rush into things. Uh, think about it. Uh, use your, you know, fire up both sides of your brain and look at the project objectively, and then. Uh, uh, we move forward uh, in a rational and, uh, you know, in a, uh, in a uh, you know, a regular pace, uh, not too slow, uh, cautious, doesn't mean too slow, uh, but uh, do not rush into projects which you are not um, uh, familiar with. Okay, thank you, Hazek. I will uh, come back to you, actually, but, uh, you know, resistance is not like, cautious is not resistant, because why to resist the changes? especially the new technologies, if we want to compete with the conventional uh, financing and you know the competition is too high. Anyway, we'll come to this uh, point maybe later in other uh, discussion. I will move now to the next uh, uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Uh, Farouk Habib. Uh, Dr. Farouk Habib, he is a co-founder of Alif Technologies, uh, United Arab Emirates. So just close to me here in Dubai. Uh, okay, Dr. Farouk is a co-founder and managing director of Alif Technologies, Dubai, UAE. He is an expert in Sharia or Islamic law, finance, and fintech. He's involved in the Islamic fintech and halal uh, digital economy, focusing on crowdfunding, uh, micro-investment, uh, tokenization, decentralized economy, halal supply chain management, and Sharia compliance. He believes in enhancing shared a prosperity by using blockchain, uh, internet of thing, artificial intelligence, big data, and predictive analytics in the halal sector, including Islamic finance. So uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Farouk uh, Habib. Uh, Dr. Farouk, uh, I'm, you are coming from a, a rich academic background and also uh, know you, uh, now you are pr uh, practicing fintech. It's not only, so you have uh, now two features, you are academics and also you are a practitioner. And like us, we are only academics. So we only know how to write 
research and how to deliver lecture, but you are now practitioner, so. Uh, Dr. Habib, uh, here, uh, you are actually, uh, in your opinion, uh, how to leverage technology in Islamic finance industry. Uh, we need you please to spotlight the points and did the Islamic fintech uh, platforms emerge in almost last decade made a uh, different from traditional Islamic financial institutions? In other words, are they outperforming or underperforming? I'm leaving the floor to you, please. Jazakumullah khaira and thank you so much, uh, Professor Dr. Hussam al -Din. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and hello everyone. Uh, it is indeed a pleasure joining this panel session from Dubai. And uh, I really would like to thank the organizer Minhaj University for arranging, arranging this uh, uh, magnificent uh, event. Uh, so, uh, and Jazakumullah khaira again, the prof for, for, for the introduction. So coming back to your questions about uh, um, that uh, what is my stance on leveraging is, uh, technology uh, in Islamic financial industry? I think that I am very much uh, uh, a believer that uh, leveraging cutting edge technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence, big data, and uh, quantum computing is coming up and 5G is already there. So these technologies can be used uh, not only for the conventional financial industry, but as well as uh, Islamic finance industry. In my opinion, uh, technology adoption is uh, more prone and uh, more suitable for Islamic finance industry in the sense that uh, Islamic finance industry is uh, claimed to be a champion of uh, ethical social values and uh, also being Sharia compliant and uh, promoting financial inclusion. All these things actually uh, make uh, Islamic finance industry a perfect match for, uh, for, for the technological adoption and uh, also leveraging on that heavily. Why? Because technology can, uh, can actually uh, enable uh, 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 Islamic finance industry uh, uh, to basically leverage and roll out different kinds of products and services to, to basically achieve its objectives. So I think that uh, this is very, very much true. Uh, and uh, I think that in the later discussion, I would be elaborating on what do I mean by, by leveraging on this technology and how we can uh, leverage on this technology. Um, so but again, the thing is, uh, we have to understand the nature and the approach of Is Islamic finance industry from the very beginning, that uh, how Islamic finance industry evolved and what is basically the approach. Like if I go back to the conceptual and theoretical debate of being Sharia compliant or Sharia based uh, was already there. So then uh, I think that the most practical approach for Islamic finance was to basically being Sharia compliant only. And uh, then uh, we, we are actually with this approach, they, it, has, it has some pros and cons. Uh, it had some advantages, but also that uh, we can see that uh, the uh, Islamic finance industry is always uh, being a follower of conventional financial industry. So in the technology adoption also, uh, this is the same route. So for example, like we have to foresee that what is conventional finance is doing, uh, how they are adopting and uh, responding to the technological advancements and changes, and only then we translate them into Islamic finance industry that is now happening, uh, uh, is still happening. Because of that, although we see that uh, uh, conventional finance is uh, moving forward in the technological advancements and like uh, Dr. Das, Dr. Hazik uh, rightly pointed out that it is very cautious uh, because uh, the industry itself is not a technology industry, it's a financial industry. So we have to see that, uh, and technology is always an enabler uh, in providing financial uh, services and products. So we have to first see that the financial viability and, uh, uh, and again, the regulations and, uh, and the legal frameworks first uh, for the financial industry, and only then we can, we can adopt uh, uh, technology. Now, I think that for Islamic finance industry, it, 
and measure that uh, to measure that uh, uh, the how the technological advancement or fintech is uh, is performing uh, and whether it is outperforming or underperforming it's very early to say because for me islamic fintech is actually not more than 5 years back because uh, if and uh, all this phenomena actually started with the with the inception of blockchain in and cryptocurrencies uh, but what i see is that uh, it has a huge huge potential at the moment even for islamic fintech because uh, technology can enable us to not only boost uh, uh, the different aspects islamic uh, fintech is uh, performing uh, it's actually uh, making performance by leaps and bounds so for example like if you see at the landscape of islamic fintech at the moment although most of them are still uh, at a startup level but there are 150 more than 150 uh, companies uh, providing products and services in the market uh with the different channels and with in different capacity for example we have challenger banks we have uh, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency uh companies we have uh, foreign exchange remittances and uh, uh money transfers we have payment systems uh, which are completely uh, sharia compliant as well as uh, uh offering something in the financial industry so we have uh, takaful also we have banking we have uh, some instruments like asset management robo advisory uh, for islamic finance also so uh, and then there are some in uh, ecosystem enablers for example like uh, 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 it and uh, infrastructure uh, providers and uh, also uh, there are some regulators there are some some other uh, players also available involved already involved in it now uh, just to uh, tell you that uh, how we can measure whether it is outperforming or underperforming i would say that in the future i can say that uh, uh, islamic fintech will surely outperform the traditional islamic finance industry now why i am saying is that like if you look at a very recent phenomena uh, which is called defi decentralized finance so i was looking at some statistics about it and uh, you can see that like in january 2020 exactly one year ago uh, the total value locked in the defi space was uh, 700 million only right after one year now if you look at it uh, how much is the value locked in the in the defi space is uh, already 27 billion dollars so i am talking about from 700 million to 27 billion dollars in within one year time so that's how the the uh, the the defi and also the whole uh, fintech space is evolving and from that i can understand that islamic finance or uh, will be outperformed by islamic fintech but i can basically uh, elaborate further in in further discussion inshallah inshallah uh, thank you dr farooq but uh, uh, just one comment on uh, about uh, we are following the conventional finance uh, you said like whatever conventional finance they come up with so we apply it to we try to adopt and then follow for the islamic finance but how about the innovation in islamic finance okay innovation in I mean, finance why we don't why we don't have we take the initiation i mean i mean why you don't take the initiation and just innovate some uh fintech or some technologies that can be even the conventional finance can really follow it or adopt it from the islamic finance i know the big difference is i know yeah i think uh, that if if i if i am to give a, to give only one reason for that uh, i would say if you look at the demographics and the geographical location uh oic countries there are 57 oic countries and uh, unfortunately all of them are uh, i mean most of majority of them are developing or underdeveloped countries so it is really really hard to actually come up with an innovative and tech driven solution uh, from a underdeveloped and developing country itself because technological infrastructure is not there 
Uh, so that is why if you look at the innovative side, it is always uh, technology from the technical side, it is always coming. The flow is from the developing con developed countries towards developing and underdeveloped countries. So because of that, although we, we are champion with the, with the Islamic finance tradition industry, because it is, uh, uh, it is a solution, an alternative solution of a Sharia compliant and Sharia based solution, solutions. But it's still, uh, the thing is like, tech, when we talk about technological advancement, we always look at the developed countries. And those are actually, majority of them are non-Islamic countries uh, in another sense. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, we maybe will come to another discussion uh, sure. later. So uh, let us move now to the, uh, our third panelist. Uh, our third uh, panelist, Mr. Uh, Omar uh, Munshi. Uh, Mr. Omar, he is uh, the uh, co-founder at Ethix Global Group of FinTech Startups Malaysia. I think we met once in Dubai, Mr. Omar. <laughs> you were in Dubai once. Okay, Mr. Uh, Omar uh, uh, is an emerging group of impact investment and Islamic crowdfunding platforms and FinTech companies regulated in multiple jurisdictions. Uh, Mr. Omar, uh, by the way, uh, uh, he is, uh, sorry, uh, he is certified fintech. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, Mr. Omar, uh, he is uh, the one, uh, Ethis actually won various uh, awards from its platform that matches more than 1,000 uh, investment from 50 plus countries to fund social housing development projects, uh, building 8,000 plus houses uh, ethics.com I was uh, launched in the third quarter of 2020 in Malaysia. It was the first Sharia compliant uh, equity uh, crowdfunding uh, platform. Uh, so I would like to uh, uh, welcome you again and please uh, everyone welcome Mr. Omar. Uh, Mr. Omar, uh, my question to you now, uh, you are a co-founder member of a group uh, startup uh, that are providing FinTech based uh, Sharia compliant financial services, and actually you are among the pioneers in Islamic FinTech. Uh, your brand ethics is performing amazingly. Uh, my question to you is related to the technology-based Islamic social finance. So what is your thought and experience about what kind of changes you observed after the advent of technology? Uh, I mean, after applying uh, tech advancement by the Islamic social finance platform. How do you compare both scenarios with technology and without technology? Mr. Omar, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Hussam. Alhamdulillah, good to see you again. Uh, also happy to see uh, familiar faces on this panel. Uh, it's a small community, we, we tend to know each other, Alhamdulillah. And uh, first of all, thank you very much to Minhaj University, the organizers, everybody involved for organizing this. Uh, Alhamdulillah, this is, I think, my, probably my third time uh, presenting in Pakistan virtually. But in future, I can present in Pakistan physically, actually, in the near future, inshallah, things get better. Um, so to address the question uh, from uh, Dr. Hussam, uh, maybe I'll take a step back about, and then I'll zoom back into to social finance. Um, because the, the answer actually, or my view um, of what the answer is, applies to finance in general, not, not specifically or only to social finance. Uh, so the way uh, I view it, and this is something that, that was echoed in various ways by the other speakers and uh, throughout the event as well, um, there is a need for Islamic finance to be able to bring its value, its solutions, which is created for humanity, not only for Muslims, uh, that needs to be effectively delivered and implemented in the modern world in this context and in this difficult uh, situation with the pandemic and so on. You know, the world is hungry for solutions. There's so many issues at many different levels in finance as well as in the economy. And Islamic finance, of course, is, you know, it, 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 we can't expect it to solve everything immediately. But there are definitely clear cases, uh, use cases, applications of Islamic finance that can bring out this value of Islamic finance 
uh, which is to uplift humanity, you know, essentially through spreading uh, or, or through transactions that are based on justice and all the other principles of Islamic finance. So maybe uh, to uh, what I, I'd like to share actually uh, as the FinTech in this space and one of the you know, early players, uh, Alhamdulillah, I think there's a good you know, early batch of founders and entrepreneurs and companies that are coming in with this uh, similar uh, aligned vision of bringing Islamic finance to the masses in the right way, inshallah, in, in a way um, that maybe I can summarize as being sustainable and impactful. And a, a, a part of that approach also includes finance that's participatory, that engages and involves the community and the people, right? Investors and, and fund raisers or those who require funds, who seek funds. There should be you know, a contract, a social contract, as well as the uh, actual uh, legal uh, contract. So that's where Islamic finance, I believe, uh, can come in. And maybe to reflect on our own mission and vision, uh, and then circle back to your question on, on, on social finance. Um, what we hope to do or what we are trying to do for a number of years now, since we started about six, seven years ago in Singapore, now we're based in Malaysia. Uh, we want to implement through Islamic finance uh, via FinTech or using FinTech. Uh, and that includes social finance as well. Uh, our own uh, part of our own vision and mission statement includes the phrase, uh, you know, circulating funds to the real economy based on universal ethics. Now, uh, our Sharia team flagged that statement. They said, what is universal ethics? There's no such thing. So you know, he said, you know, it's actually vague, it can create confusion. So why we put that in is internally our DNA, we understand it's all based on Islam, based on the fundamentals of, of the Muamalat. Uh, but when we present it to the world, we, we also want to have a more neutral approach, both to Muslims as well as non-Muslim non customers and, and, and clients and users, right? So that I feel uh, is, is what technology brings to the table, what FinTech brings to the table. We now have this opportunity to uh, create solutions, products, platforms, ecosystems, and, and manifest what we've, we know in Islamic finance in those solutions. And this is something that uh, may sound a bit abstract, but in reality, it's not so complex, uh, and it can exist in many small different levels and pockets. Right now, you know, there are examples and cases of very good utilization of tech in various different uh, Muslim countries and Muslim contexts. And those use cases can actually be, you know, uh, scaled up tremendously and exported and shared around uh, the world, the Muslim world and the, 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 the wider uh, world, everybody. Yeah? So my view is um, whether it's crowdfunding or blockchain, they are basically enablers, right? Um, if we, just now you mentioned Dr. Usam, why are we following? Why are we also trying to use blockchain? I think these are, are technologies and these are applications um, that were created that can enable things essentially. So what we need to look at is not let's create our own kind of protocol and things like that, is what's available there already, how can we implement it you know, through Islamic finance? At the same time, R&D and so on can continue, we can create our own things. But the things that are already there, we're not yet utilizing, right? So for social finance, you know, the, the, the flow of funds in social finance is incredibly huge. Zakat alone, and then when you count uh, everything else from Wakaf to Sadaka, there's so much moving and there's so much room for enhancement and, and improvement. And that's what FinTech can and needs to do. Uh, uh, Indonesia, for example, I want to highlight one example before I, I uh, summarize, and maybe you have a question. Um, in Indonesia, there's a, a, uh, although it's an emerging uh, country, you know, it's not considered a first world country, but it has implemented FinTech in various different forms very successfully in social finance. Right? Part of it is, is led by the people, the communities, and part of it by the religious organizations and, and groups. So I think those examples, uh, I'm sure, are also happening in other parts of the world. Uh, and this is what we need to really highlight and we need to focus on, especially for social finance. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll end for, for now. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you, Omar. Uh, Omar, so do you think like FinTech really help you to achieve your mission and goals? Yes, so for example, 
we have a platform called Global Sadaka, which uh, essentially matches uh, charities, NGOs, uh, social enterprises to funders, donors, uh, the public, corporates, and, and so on. So uh, what it uses at this point is essentially basic web technology, like e-commerce technology, matching people to projects, projects to people, and facilitating the transaction. Right? For, for us, we see into how what are the different types of transactions that we can link up with using our platform. For example, you can donate, of course, uh, cash. You can donate uh, through a third-party app in the form of gold. You can donate or, or give sadaka uh, through Bitcoin. You know, so there is a community of Muslims that have Bitcoins, and, and they want to, some of them prefer to pay it in that form instead of converting it to, converting it to fiat money. So these are all things that we allow or facilitate uh, to happen on our platform. So, and these are all you know, based on uh, technology, basic technology. When you go deeper, uh, I think the, Dr. Farouk earlier mentioned, uh, Dr. Hazik as well, you know, when you go deeper into how to enhance things, how to automate things, how to lock and, and develop trust. And that is where all these FinTech applications and technologies can play a very, very significant role in a way that probably was not possible uh, uh, before in the past. You know? So uh, I, definitely FinTech technology has, has made a big difference. And the other difference is also to, to remove or reduce the borders, uh, the, the boundaries uh, between countries and between communities. Because when you go online, it's all borderless. And right now, Alhamdulillah, Global Sedeka, as well as on Ethis, people are investing and donating uh, from everywhere. You know, uh, majority of the funds that go to our investment projects, a large majority. And these are Muslims looking for investments. They are normal, small time investors, and they're also bigger investors. And they are looking for how do we invest in things that Sharia compliant. So there is a lack of that in the traditional financial system because it's all very much uh, limited in some sense to the territory. But with FinTech, you can really uh, transcend this kind of boundaries. Yep. Uh, MashaAllah. Uh, okay, we'll uh, definitely will come back uh, to you, Omar. Uh, I will move now to our uh, next uh, panelist. Uh, our next uh, panelist, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Uh, Adnan uh, Akram. Uh, Mr. Adnan Akram is a co-founder of Fingel Global Incorporation uh, Canada. Uh, Mr. Adnan, he is a leading financial technology professional with more than as seven years of industry experience. He has led various technology projects in major banks and other financial institutes across Canada. He is certified FinTech professional from Said Business School, University of Oxford. Uh, he is also the co-founder of uh, Fingil a Global Incorporation in Canada. Uh, Fingil Corp uh, Global is a <coughs> dedicated institute to provide innovative financial solutions uh, digital transformational strategies, uh, digital economic policy solutions, high performance leadership via a new age, uh, corporate training and formation and capacity building programs. So, uh, mashallah, very rich uh, professional experience from uh, Dr. Uh, or Mr. Adnan. <clears throat> so I would like uh, to welcome you again. And uh, uh, Dr. Adnan, uh, or you are joining us, of course, from Canada, and you and your company, Fingel Global, are offering uh, innovative financial solutions uh, or products, digital strategies, directions, training to overcome financial industries challenges, right? So uh, my question to you is that, uh, what is your opinion? Uh, does FinTech is something that can provide solutions to the blood, to the problem facing by Islamic financial industry, uh, please identify those problems and how fintech can solve issues. Uh, in other words, please share your experience or any case study. Thank you, Mr. Adnan. Please, brother. Yeah, thank you for your generous introduction. Um, <laughs> that was really, uh, you know, generous. Uh, first of all, I'm honored uh, to be part of this discussion and grateful to all of you for investing your time on this event. Good afternoon and evening, which part of the world you're joining from. Uh, let me tell you one trend that uh, the pandemic has caused the global economy to contract by 4.4%. But at the same time, 
digitalization is accelerating. So that shows the power of technology helping in every aspect of the um, uh, uh, you know economy, not just the finance world. Coming back to your question, that how technology can provide solutions to the challenges uh, currently Islamic finance industry is facing. Certainly, financial technologies are not only that plateful to tackle core finance issues, namely uh, financial inclusion, liquidity management, but also it is capable to respond to the other challenges which is uh, faced by the finance industry, such as regulatory hurdles, competition from conventional banks, lack of equity, adequately qualified and trained personnel. These are really exacerbating the situation at the moment. Uh, but in my view, the Islamic fine industry can also leverage even more uh, power Islamic fintech for better for inclusion. If you look at the um, if you look at the Islamic uh, assets growth, uh, research um, published by Reef and and ICD, they are estimating uh, 2.9 trillion currently uh, to grow uh, to 3.5 trillion. So that shows, uh, you know, the growth uh, capability or growth opportunity here uh, for um, for the Islamic finance industry. How are we gonna get these, uh, you know, gap filled? Definitely by the financial inclusion, uh, the first and foremost. So if uh, we have this, if we still have this, those societies where uh, the economy is still fragile and where clients are still uh, not bankable or underbanked. We need those people to be financially included. And uh, like you said, um, what kind of solutions technology can provide? So crowdfunding, crowdfunding platforms, digital banking and mobile banking solutions uh, can help and you, know, uh, you know foster innovative solutions to reach out to those financially excluded communities. Uh, look, look at the initiative of Ampasa in Kenya, where a mobile-based money transfer service payments and microfinancing service in Kenya, very successful alternative to access to financial services. So Islamic financial institutions can also provide crowdfunding and other solution P2P lending with uh, rapid AI-based vetting of creditworthy recipients. So in this solution, actually you can also target non-Muslim community uh, which were left apart, uh, you know, um, in most of the financial parks uh, offered by the uh, Islamic financial institutes. Um, second problem, I like identified the uh, liquidity management. It's really hard to find Sharia compliant places where to park your short term funds for liquidity management. Question here is how about how to turn those uh, traditional funding tools into asset-backed projects that, cost, that cuts the cost or foster inclusion, gain efficiency. You know, the earlier Murabha system was introduced, um, but it turned out that amount exchange did not, amount exchanges uh, did not involve the real commodities. That was the actual uh, problem with that product. A blockchain solutions also um, can help to manage liquidity through creating a digital uh, platform exchange commodities and asset-backed financial products effectively. Tokenization has the potential significantly impacting financial markets, lowering the transaction costs, introducing pro programmable compliance, reducing settlement time, increasing liquidity. So. These are the solutions which can be adopted, offered by the technology. It doesn't have to be conventional, or uh, you know, if if the if the um, if the regulators are uh, you know here to help, uh, then definitely these solutions can be adopted to solve those problems. Um, lack of trust is another uh, another problem, you know in the islamic finance industry so islamic finance industry more trans it, they have to be more transparent and increase the trust for more data security and any given transaction uh, blockchain again uh, it's technology it's an immutable uh, where you can have more trust through a distributed ledger system tracing the cryptographical secure distribution channels and uh, transfer of high customizable digital exchange public can trace and trust uh, so you can increase the con 
confidence uh, of the people by showing those traces. Uh, another problem is the institutional framework or the or you call it Shia governance framework, which is a definitive roadblock to the innovation. In my view, national regulations are not enough here since the digital business models are global. We need international regulatory environment in Islamic finance industry. So I would suggest IFSB, ILLM, and ICD. These are cross border uh, liquidity management and other regulatory bodies to come up and, uh, you know, how can this uh, developing a framework which can, uh, you know, uh, we can benefit from uh, uh, to offer the solution here. I would say we, uh, we should have the technology enabled, uh, you know, AI or ML based each year advisory, uh, like where you have two way communication, um, you know, the Sharia advisors should also um, fed information into the ML based and AI based uh, programs. So it's not a one way just like where you have a, a computer just offering pre fed, uh, you know, the uh, guidance. So if uh, Sharia advisors can also respond and help in building a database, uh, that would be a good product for the uh, industry uh, to leverage on. I think so Dubai Islamic Bank is already uh, working towards those initiatives. Another uh, problem is the competitive uh, edge or advantage. So FinTech, you know, um, has the those uh, a competitive advantage uh, over incumbents um, which can, you know, really digitalize the economic landscape better. They are well positioned to recruit uh, young talent and uh, you know for the innovation and they also have the latest uh, technology to build the system on or the infrastructure not only the legacy IT structures or systems where the um, you know original or old old days banking system were um, built so in Islamic finance institutions should provide uh, solutions for consumer welfare by matching their preferences using uh, data matching assistance tools to reduce the transactional costs. Um, I mean here, the if you look at the uh, industry giants like Amazon, Google, they all have data, um, you know, matching assistance for to match the customer preferences. Uh, one time, if, he, if a customer is looking at the product, so they, and they are now understanding the behavior of that um, customer to offer him better products next time. So in order, in order for Islamic finance industry uh, to be competitive, they should also be looking to have in their system those kind of uh, solutions where they can offer people who are looking at product and uh, looking at their behavior, looking at their risk appetite and looking at their needs um, by incorporating data technology based data assistance matching tools. Uh, lastly, the problem of uh, money laundering or financial crimes, I would say. Um, here, we all know that's a big financial uh, uh, problem uh, in the industry. Uh, the blockchain also here can solve the financial crime and help prevent corruption and money laundering. The decentralized cryptographic framework of record keeping makes it harder for criminals and fraudsters to break through. You know, you call it criminal enterprise or libertarian paradise. It also it depends on your perspective, but the fact is blockchain is helping governments and financial industry to uncover the shadow economy. A uh, perfect example we've seen in the past is the, um, the shutdown of digital black market uh, platform called Silk Road. They have seized the Bitcoin wallets in US. Um, you know, these are certainly those, uh, you know, um, solutions by the technology is helping to, um, you know, uh, solve the in problems faced by the industry. Uh, I would say the, you know, Based on the facts, I must say Islamic finance fintech is not only capable of resolving the current issues, but the industry can also leverage 
from the Power Islamic FinTech for the better financial inclusion. That's all. Thank you. That's my perspective. Thank you, Brother Adnan. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ijaz, do we have a questions from the... Uh... Uh, yes, we have a questions, but we have a very short, short time. So... Okay. <clears throat> can, can we take one or two questions? Because I've seen some questions about the cryptocurrencies. Okay. Uh, okay especially yes, the sure. Bitcoins. I mean. Okay, yes, sure, bro. One or two questions, yes, sure. Okay. Yes, Maybe uh, <clears throat> Dr. Farouk, uh, what, what do you think about the... Uh, are we going to see uh, soon like a cryptocurrency, Islamic cryptocurrency, you think? Yeah, we have already got some actually. Uh, yep. just and to, to which uh, extent it's comply with Sharia? This is the uh, a big question actually and the concern. Okay, due to the time constraint, I think that I'm gonna uh, say it very very briefly. Uh, that uh, now I I receive so many questions every day about cryptocurrencies. That okay, which this this currency or that currency, whether currency whether it is Sharia compliant or not. Um, so. The thing is now we have to consider that uh, cryptocurrency itself is uh, is wrong is a is a wrong terminology. So they are not cryptocurrencies per se, but they are uh, crypto assets. Number one. So when we consider them as assets, not as currency specifically, then actually we are going into the right direction. Number one. Number two is then we have to analyze each and every crypto asset according to its nature, according to its features, according to its objectives. Because there are now more than 8,000 uh, crypto assets uh, available in the market. Uh, and uh, Bitcoin is only, by the way, one of them. So we have to analyze each of them before saying that whether it is Sharia compliant or not. This is the thing. So uh, the statement, uh, whether all crypto assets are Sharia compliant is wrong. The statement like all Sharia compliant uh, crypto assets are non Sharia compliant is again wrong. So the thing is like we have to have each and every crypto asset analyzed from the Sharia perspective. Only then we can say whether it is Sharia compliant or not. Uh, there are so many crypto assets which I am already working with uh, and uh, there are already some in the market. Thank you very much, Dr. Farooq Habib. Uh, we have a very short of time. So, Alhamdulillah, it was a very instructive and productive session. Thank you very much, Dr. Hussam and other panelists, Dr. Hazik, Dr. Farooq Habib, Mr. Umar Munshi, and Mia Muhammad Adnan Akram. The next session about the Cambridge quiz. So, for this, I would like to invite Ms. Hadia Saki to hold this session. <laughs>